You perhaps don't know the story of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, but I would tell you that at Christmas, most of us, if you attend a Christian church, you sing, I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. Longfellow was really inspired to write this poetry during this time period. But his son approached him, photograph of his son down in the lower right. His son approached him and said, Dad, I'd like to go in the military. And Longfellow said, I don't want you to do that. He did anyway, and he was seriously wounded. He took a ball through the chest that came out near his spine. When Longfellow was told that his son would probably not survive that wound, Longfellow wrote the second verse, which Almost in any church, any, any hymn fest, you don't sing that second verse. In despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and it mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill toward men. And then Longfellow learned that his son had rallied, and indeed his son would survive. He would suffer from his war wound all of his life, but he did survive. And Longfellow then wrote, then pealed the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep, the wrong shall fail, the right prevail with peace on earth, goodwill toward men. This next Christmas season, remember that song, and remember the story that goes with it. The Night Before Christmas. It was written in 1823 by Clement Moore, but it impacted the photograph of Thomas Nast, it in, it, it, that individual. He had read this during the war, and he read it at a time when he knew that the soldiers in the field, the northern soldiers, needed something to inspire them. Again, 1862 had been a bad year for the Union. They had lost battle after battle after battle after battle. It looked as though the, the southerners were on the verge of victory. So Thomas Nast, as only an artist can do, an illustrator, had read the night before Christmas, and in his mind he began to conjure up different ideas and different thoughts. He took his pen and his palette, and he began to do sketching. And he came up with the very first American Santa Claus, which is that impish little character sitting on these boxes way over here. Indeed, he was a dwarf. He's not the roly-poly Santa that you and I think of. He was a little dwarf, and he was strange. He had that long white beard and long hair, and he dressed. He didn't have a fashion designer, that was certain. He also, Nast went to the absurd. He put him in a, a sleigh that was driven by flying reindeers. How strange and how odd. But yet Nast thought, I'll bet some of the soldiers will look at this, they will laugh, it will make them a little more ebullient, it will increase their spirit. In fact, this Santa Claus, if you look at what he's holding in his hand, it's a little puppet. Jefferson Davis, the Confederate president, is the little puppet that's being distributed. And the soldiers here are from New York. They're New York soldiers. That is the first illustration of an American Santa Claus. Now, in the 1870s, Nash Santa Claus would turn into the roly-poly fellow that uh, we know today. And in the 1870s, another thing that Nash did was he created the democratic symbol, the donkey, and the confederate, uh, the confederate, the, oh, that's bad, um, <laughs> the, the, the republican <laughs> symbol uh, of the elephant. I apologize to all you Republicans. Uh, <laughs> that was my faux pas. Um, but, Nast was a marvelous illustrator, a marvelous illustrator. Santa Claus and these other characters are, are so fabulous. Art. Many of us love art. We love to go through the museums and look at, at art. We buy art books. Some of us are well enough off maybe that we can purchase some of the art or some of the less, less expensive illustrations that we like. These are four of my favorite pieces from the American Civil War, done by artists of the time. These were artists who traveled in the field, who saw the soldiers, who knew what they wore. My favorite picture of all four of these is the one in the bottom right corner by James Taylor. James Taylor was a soldier. He was a soldier's artist. He traveled with an Ohio regiment. And this little illustration was made in 1864 in the Shenandoah Valley. The gentleman right up in the front is Philip Sheridan, 
Little Phil Sheridan on his famous horse Rienzi, later called Winchester. The gentleman right behind him is our own Michigan George Custer, young Brigadier General, the boy general. And over here is Wesley Merritt, another Brigadier General. What a great piece of art in a moment in history captured by these artists. But again, the ties that bind bring us to modern artists. Perhaps some of you here have seen Sidney King's paintings on, on our Civil War battlefields at national parks. Mort Kunstler and Keith Rocco and Don Troiani are known as great artists today. Music. How can you study any period of history and not understand or listen to the music of the time? You know some of these songs, the battle cry of freedom, the bonnie blue flag, Dixie's land, marching through Georgia. But there is no Civil War song that compares to the Battle Hymn of the Republic. In April of 2008, His Holiness Pope Benedict came to the United States and he visited the President at the White House. The United States Army Chorus was gathered in front of the White House on the lawn. And what did they sing? They sang, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. He hath loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His, so, uh, his truth goes marching on. As a kid, when I used to hear that song as just a, maybe probably a teenager at the time, but it raised the hackles on the back of my neck. It sent shivers down my spine. It still does today. I love this song. It's, in, it's a great Civil War piece that has transcended decades, generations. In the camps, Soldiers love to play their, what we think of as folk music. The fiddle, the jaw harp, the banjo, the guitar, the harmonica. And they would sing and oftentimes dance. But that also transcends. I come from the 1960s, the folk traditions. And some of these artists up here you would probably recognize, and you might recognize the Civil War songs they sang. Mavis Staples, just a couple years ago, did this wonderful piece, it's a Stephen Foster piece, Hard Times, which is so relevant for the problems that we have today. Joan Baez, The Night They Drove Old Dixie Down, Goober Peas by the Kingston Trio, Carolyn Hester's version of Oh Captain, My Captain, that great allegorical poem about Lincoln's assassination. Some of you saw Love Me Tender, it was the first movie that Elvis Presley ever made. You may or may not remember that it was took place during the Civil War. And he sang, love me tender, love me true, sweet, I don't know, however it goes. That's a Civil War song. They just changed the verse. It was Aura Lee. When we think of great American speeches, nothing tops the Gettysburg Address. It's only 272 words. It doesn't take three minutes to render it. And it is considered one of the finest speeches ever given in the English language, if not the greatest speech. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Every school kid learns that. They at least read it. Some memorize it. If you were in my class, you memorized it. Down here on the left is a picture of Lincoln ta taken in June of 1860. And if you look at the other photograph, it's a picture of Abraham Lincoln taken a week or so before he was assassinated. We always talk about the strain, the stress on any person that's in the presidential office, the chief executive, the, the oppressive nature of that office, what that man as a CEO has to do. And it ages them rapidly, and especially in times of war. So we don't even have a five-year difference between the clean-shaven Lincoln and the bearded very terribly aged Lincoln in the other photo.